Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the show. I begin by introducing you from uh, Teresa Omondi, who is the executive director of FIDA Kenya. Thank you very much. We have good Dr. Morning. Caesar Mwangi, who is the founding director, Center for Personal Leadership. We have uh, Nerima Wako Ojiwa, who is executive director for Siasa Place. And then we have uh, Pamela Mboria, communication specialist. And finally, Rungu Hilton, who is still at Amnesty. <laughs> Good morning. One year, one year, actually, two days ago. Okay. <laughs> Karibuni sana. This morning, we want to talk about leadership. In the past week alone, the political leaders in this country, unfortunately, we have to benchmark with the political leadership of this country. Every time we talk about leadership, we all, all we see uh, politicians, which is unfortunate, but we have to benchmark. Aside from the charade in the Jubilee Party, Moses Kuria, uh, we also saw what happened in the county government of Nairobi. The exchange between uh, the governor and one of the CECs who just, who just left office. So I want to give you an opportunity, each of you, to define leadership um, from where they sit. And I'll begin with you right here. Yeah. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I think. And I believe that leadership is about consistency and servantship. Because uh, what happens is that most of our leaders uh, think when they get there, it's a right that they deserve it. But I think it's about the people who believed, either in voting for you or appointing you. And so having, uh, being able to be consistent on the promises that you had and consistent also on the responsibilities and duties that you have. Okay. Yes. Okay. Caesar. Yeah. <clears throat> From where I sit, and of course this word leadership is always being bandied around, uh, and there are various forms of leadership, I guess, which we <coughs> talk about. But from where I sit, I think what is most critical at this stage of our life is the leadership of our country, is a leadership that will transform this country from the incredible inequality and poverty that exists, the serious divisions, the serious self-interests, to one which focuses on transforming this country, which is to make it inclusive, focused on the greater good, and focused on service. I think leadership without service is not leadership at all. Okay. It is a joke, and that is what we're experiencing right now, and it's a disaster which is happening. Yeah. Okay. Leadership. That's my leadership. So it has to have service, okay. service element in it. Transformative and service. Transformative yes. and service oriented. Yeah. Narima. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have to be visionary as well where when you see leaders who are good leaders they have a futuristic aspect of their populations they are normally selfless and i think kenya is interesting because we're one of those countries where almost everybody wants to be a politician normally because of the amount of pressure especially for good leaders they understand that they carry the whole nations on their backs and for them they have this amount of pressure to be able to meet promises that they have made and they have sleepless nights because of that so a good leader is one who is able to make sure that the resources when we talk about good governance public resources are held accountable and not only that making sure that there's no corruption but because they sit on that seat they must behave according to the standards that they are pushing for so a good leader is one who has vision one who is selfless one who is committed one who is constantly concerned about their people okay Pamela thank you um, let me take it from uh, what we have seen this morning uh, from the women uh, various parties coming together I would want to believe in a way, they are showing leadership because it's people from different divides and saying we are doing it for this country, first of all, for the women of this country and for this country. I would want to look at that as leadership. Of course, the question is, how long is that going to hold? I want to hold those women accountable because those women have been put to leadership or have been given the mandate to lead by citizens of this country. This is the one time that we expect to see leadership in its true form. And I would want to believe that whatever agenda they have is going to transform the way leadership, leadership is perceived in this country. So go for it, women. Uh, let's see leadership this one time. 
I think that for me there are two, two major distinctions of leadership. The first is um, uh, leaders express ideas and are not preoccupied with identities. Um, and this uh, it applies to the current debate within uh, Jubilee, whether it is really a conversation about ethical leadership and the future of this country or whether it is about simply capture of state power. The second distinction relates to vulnerability. Um, courage, leadership cannot take place in the context of a sense of risk and a sense of sacrifice. Uh, bold leaders that we know historically or in the Kenyan context um, uh, currently are people who continually put themselves, their careers, their reputation and even their very lives at the risk and we're seeing that um, in different places. Last year I was very impressed or inspired by um, the experience of, uh, just to give you one example, uh, the administrative police Joash Ombati who um, refused to execute two suspects in full view of a, a, a crowd that was calling for mob violence. Um, and he said, no, there is a rule of law here. I am instructed as a police officer to follow the rule of law. And he proceeded to arrest these uh, criminals, uh, these alleged criminals, and take them to court. So I think vulnerability is a core element of leadership. And then the third, third one, really, is, um, I guess, success. Um, leaders are successful. So uh, being able to apply um, a sense of timing, a sense of uh, disruptive, uh, practical, uh, a practical uh, disruptive approach to the way that you work is necessarily a part of leadership. You have to be able to uh, break through that which you find in the, in the context in which you're operating. Okay. Unfortunately, every description and definition of a leader that I've gotten from you doesn't apply to most of the people we are seeing currently in the national platform and uh, in the manner in which they carry out themselves, in the manner in which, we, in which they speak and on. So I'd like to begin from also where we left. Where did we go wrong as Kenyans? I think that's an open discussion. Where did we go wrong? So then, Ken, you're provoking me and it's my first time back in the studio this year, so I have lots of things to say. A pet peeve. The 401 commendations that uh, the head of state made uh, just towards the end of last year, um, as I looked at the names and I went through all of the names, and I'll spare us the details of you know, that relative of that uh, powerful person, uh, that, um, uh, you know, I mean, all the different cases. But I think what struck me a little bit is we have lost the ball in terms of our ability to be able to cite uh, leadership and to uh, accord it recognition. Um, most of our commendation lists now look like a, a graduation class people who have been in public office for another year and therefore need another uh, award, or they are really acts of patronage. What we are not able to see in the list of people that have been commended is a clear citation of how they have sacrificed, how they have brought honor, and how they have brought bravery to the, to the republic. And I think that, if you want a demonstration of how we are losing our capacity to be able to um, acknowledge leadership, that is a clear demonstration, and I hope the next um, set of awards will be different. But who do we blame for this, Iran? Mm -hmm. can, I, can, I, can I just uh, address that question? Okay. Where did we go wrong? Yes. Okay. And if we look back, what we are seeing now is actually the fruits of a couple of values. Okay? And one of those values is individualism and materialism. Okay? Individualism, materialism, mm -hmm. all captured in the concept of selfishness, me, myself, and I. So a lot of our leaders, I call them leaders in quotes, are not focused on the service they shall give. They are focused on what is in it for me. And I think we embrace that in an early stage of our, of our, of our democracy, unfortunately, where people got positions of power and they realize from these positions of power, I can actually enrich myself. It's an avenue for me to enrich myself. And if I can do it and get away with it, then I will be the richest guy in town and because there's so much poverty in our country, I'll be able to buy the votes I need. <laughs> so there's been a race to amass material things through positions of power. Okay? And unfortunately in this country, this is one of the countries that I know where one of the most lucrative jobs is to be in politics and in a position of power, whether in government, in a parastito, or whatever the case is. And one of the least paying jobs is to be a professional or to be a serious, or to be a serious professional or a business person trying to make a living, which is unfortunate. On the countries that take these things seriously, yeah. the best paying professions are the professionals. In fact, in countries like Japan, teachers are among the best paid people. Okay? But in this country, teachers are the worst paid. The people who are supposed to be passing on the right values to our kids. So we are somehow uh, working in, 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 in an upside down position, expecting to get a good result. And that is where we went wrong, in our value system. 
Okay, yeah. but but that's not true to everyone because not yeah. all politicians or people true. have gone to political offices yeah. have gone there for wealth. They've gone also to protect to what they have. Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. yes. Okay. But okay. I think uh, okay. Sorry, I, I think where we went wrong is at the point of nominating and electing who are, who is going to be the leader. So right at the beginning. Right of at the, the beginning, and I have institutions like IBC that failed us on these grounds. We have a good constitution that clearly says who should la run as a leader in this country. And the qualities are correctly spelled out in the Constitution. We are looking at things of integrity, selfless uh, service, good things that we have already mentioned here. But did we actually allow those people who are of integrity, who are honest, who are selfless, who have shown service before to be the people to run for elections in this country? Okay. And that also goes for appointments. When we go for appointments, our nomination process, do we choose people who meet these criteria, which we all voted for in 2010? So I think that's the beginning of the problem, because we don't expect a bad person to be a good person and they become a leader. If that was the threshold, no one would be elected mm. in this country. I think there are very good, <laughs> many, many good people. You can start from this if, panel. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but if, if the voters were given that choice, we would not get a lot of people elected. Yes. Uh, let me go back to your in, uh, initial question, and that is, um, Whatever we are seeing in this country, does it reflect the, what this panel has talked about, uh, the way they perceive leadership? Absolutely not. Um, and that's when we need to distinguish between the politicians that we have and the leadership we are seeking as a country. Um, we, you asked who is to blame. Um, we can't run away from it, all of us, and it's not so much as blame game, but we need to actually do something drastic so that we can get the leaders that we deserve in this country. Um, I know that a few of them, yes, are good leaders, but majority of the people we have in this country whom we look up to, to guide the direction that this country is taking, I'm sorry that they don't represent the role models who a leader should be. They, their, heart, their heart is not with the people. They are not with us that they don't represent the issues that concern the Mwananchi. You travel this country, and some places when you go, you just wonder, do these people have a leader at all? You know, they've never seen their leader. And it's such a pity so that when we talk leadership, they are not in touch with the people. And that is one of the greatest elements of a leader, that they need to understand what it is that they are representing about their people so that they can bring those issues to the fore. Um, of course, leaders must know that they don't have monopoly over ideas, best ideas on leadership. Are they able to tap on the skills of people around them and work with them so that they can have better leadership for this country? I think that's one of the missing elements because a lot of these people, whether it's at the county level, whether it's at the national level, sometimes the people around them are not doing any good. And this leader must also admit that you cannot please everybody all the time. Sometimes you take drastic measures. Are they that courageous to do that? Okay. Narima, about a week ago, the president said something profound. He talked about if you are out to serve, then why must it be you? I mean, why do you have to be the one? Mm -hmm. If you just want to serve, it means if I'm given an opportunity, well and good. If I'm not, well and good. But why must I fight to ensure that I serve? <laughs> I think also when we even look at our leaders themselves, every time that there's something happening within the counties, they have to show that it's being launched. It has to be on Facebook. We even seen our own governor with videos from his phone. And it's the kind of culture that we have. And what are we showing young people? Basically, it shows that only those who are seen in the limelight to be performing well are the ones who get rewarded. It doesn't necessarily mean that we instill a culture in our youth that even just picking up garbage around you, not to throw things outside the window, is good as a citizen. It's good enough you are paying service to this country. It has to be that you have to be seen to do something. And just to talk about what I've heard other panelists speak, our leaders are actually dealers where they're going into government to make certain positions for themselves and self-interest. But even when we talk about last year with the exams and we're so proud that there was no cheating, but nobody is talking about how many young people actually failed 
which is a concern because that number is large compared to how many pass. Mm -hmm. Or we're not even talking about that from like 1994 to 2016, all those youth were cheating. So now we have a generation of cheaters who are now in the workforce and they have only known how to reach certain levels through cheating and through making sure that's that they are paying. Con you're condemning us. I'm not condemning. I'm just saying it's a large number. And I deal with university students and some of them have even told me they never attended classes, but, but they, they are passed. there at their graduation. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the reality on the ground. And if we want to talk about the leaders that we have, we need to talk about the population that we're in. Because these same leaders come from this very same population. So when we talk about everyone saying that it must be them to serve, it is because we do not support those, as what Irungu was saying, those who are actually doing well in the community are not recognized. But those who perceive or have a perception of doing well are the ones who are recognized but and I asked, related. Whose problem is that? I think it's, a, it's, a, it's everybody's problem. It cannot point How can it be my in. problem that we don't recognize the right people? Are we doing anything to instill that? Yes. Do you so have can it be my problem? So can we come back to a very <laughs> basic point? And Nerim yes. is spot on on this, on this point. Yes. We have a very cheap relationship to our word. We use the word, I promise, like it's something you throw away. I will be there on time. Mm -hmm. And we know we're not going to be there on time. Um, we, so basically, I think the, our word, our capacity to be able to deliver our word is weak, generally, as a, as a nation. And it's not just Kenya. It's across the world. Um, there are two distinctions, and there's a friend of mine who once said, there are only two types of people in this country. There are donkeys and there are monkeys. Donkeys are the people who put in the hard work. Monkeys are the ones that come in at the last minute and claim success for the work that they have not done. Mm -hmm. Now, before anybody goes there, I'm not calling politicians monkeys it, or state officers monkeys. We have a lot of monkeys in the civil society, and we have many of them in the mm -hmm. business sector as well. So that's the first distinction. The second one is one that we use a lot. We talk about VIPs, very important persons. But actually, we fail to recognize the more important VIPs are very impactful persons. That impact, rather than um, importance, is actually what will deliver a country that we can be proud of. And I think that's the two distinctions that come back to your question about why is it that we do not have a country that we are proud of, that we, are, we feel safe in, and we feel dignified mm. at all points. OK. Yeah, um, Nerima, uh, when uh, she said the university students that she's working with, they're cheaters, where are they getting that from? Whom are they copying Where did they learn the bad manners? Yes, yeah. I mean, it's because of the people that they are seeing ahead of them. That's the leadership that they are copying. So when I say that um, we are to blame all of us in this country, is because of the people we put in positions. Where are the good leaders? Can they present themselves, you know? to be elected, because when you look around during campaigns, during elections, um, sometimes you have no choice, really, because it's the politicians, it's the people who are loudest, who make the loudest noise, who are able to just run around asking for votes. But we need to get to a place where we can get real leaders presenting themselves, and it's an issue about leaders in this country. We don't see them coming forward for those elective posts, because they don't want to be you know, to it's get into weird. that, you yes. know. <laughs> yes, we need to get there. Yeah. And um, about our voters themselves, we as voters, do we really want to vote politicians or people who are just there for their own, you know, agenda or people who represent us and lead this country? I just want to, I want to add on to that. I mean, she raises a question about good people coming out to become political leaders. Okay? Uh, one thing, first of all, I want to mention is leadership does not have to be def um, um, focused on the political space alone. We are all leaders in our sphere of influence. I think that's the first thing we have to be mm. very clear about. And we should never be helpless about saying, since politicians are useless, there's no other leaders anywhere who are not doing very good work. Their excellent work is going on in this country, in different spheres. And I know people even on this panel who are doing excellent work in the leadership role they play in their sphere of influence. And I'd like that to continue. Now, the next space about politics is because politics gives you the visibility, right? And it gives you an opportunity to drive very important values as a visible leader. And perhaps that is what we should be seeking. 
if people are to get into politics, they have an opportunity to drive very important values that can actually transform this country to be a very great country. And maybe that is where we are lacking. Mm -hmm. But values is where our problem is. Okay? okay. That's where our problem is. And values start in the home. Parents are, are leaders in their homes because that's where they teach the values to their children. Values can be taught in our schools and values can be taught in society through the visible leadership that there is. So all of us can fit in one of those spaces mm. and contribute to leadership at a very personal level. We should never be helpless about that. But our voters, as you say, there's a problem. The problem is the huge poverty here and the huge divisions that are brought about by our visible leaders and put fear into our voters that if you do not vote for this one, you will be in trouble with that one. And because these people are somehow vulnerable, then they vote for those who seem like they will be the saviors. And so we have tribal kingpins and we become a tribalite society because of the serious poverty and the fear put into our voters. And these are some of the issues we need to fundamentally address in this country. Okay. Yeah. I'll just speak just a, a little bit about the, the voters. I mean, I agree with all the panelists that uh, uh, the voters could also have been challenged. But I, I also just want to remind ourselves that within the same voters, we've had people who've actually tried to challenge the kind of leaders who are going to be put, I mean, to run for elections. We've seen co uh, suits in court. We have seen people challenging, writing uh, petitions to uh, institutions such as the IBC. The courts have been asked to help, you know, to block some of these leaders who are outrightly known not to be servants or they have not provided good leadership. But when some of these institutions fail us, and that's why in as much as yes, we want to say as voters we have failed, we have a problem, but there are few voters who stand out. I mean, all Kenyans can't stand out and go to court or face ABC or go to the streets. We've had civil society even demo demonstrating. We've had, I mean, complaints out there of people who are saying, wait a minute, these are not the leaders we want. But if we don't have institutions that can support that kind of, uh, I mean, block such kind of leadership, because, I mean, that's the only way. But if we have already... Uh, in quotes, bad leaders already nominated, and th that's what I have to go to the ballot box and vote. And I, I, at the same time, I'm being reminded that I have a civic duty to vote, and on that morning, I have to wake up and vote. If I've been given two rotten bananas, for example, I'll just have to think of which one looks less a bit not. better. Yes, and the worst thing also is that after that, you have to work with that banana. I'm using a banana, for example. And unfortunately, whether you, you, you are a person of integrity or you feel this was not right, but if that's the current governor, for but example, you have, you if that's to. the president you have, is that the, if that's the deputy president you have, unfortunately, that's the person you have to work with. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nerima. Um, you know, the, I, I agree, especially on issues of values, but I think it's also a little bit complex because... I could have values, but I'm put in a situation where my values go out the window. Where even, for instance, to go through our court systems, where I know people who've been in court cases for almost 10 years, mm -hmm. and you're doing the right thing. But every time you go, the other person is going, bribing this lawyer, bribing that. The court never happens. The case never happens. So even as much as I can have all the values imaginable, even the ones in the Bible, but then I'm thrown into this space where people with values do not succeed. And it's, it's back to problems of our institutions, back to not working with systems, back to now, this is where I can now start talking about values. As long as systems exist and they exist for all, and we're all equal under that system, you can bring in my values, but I can have values and the system does not work for me. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 sorry, I don't, I don't want to talk too much, but this issue of values <laughs> is so important. Mm. And I think Nerima raised an important point, and what she's basically saying, it is difficult to exercise good, virtuous values mm -hmm. in a rotten system. <laughs> okay. To understand. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, do you then throw your values out of the window, or you do continue or, to... Or you fix or you the also, system first. Or you fix the system, mm -hmm. or you, but, you, but do, you, do you just throw your values out of the window and say, let me join the rot, the rot. right? Mm -hmm. Or let me stick to my values and do the best that I can do with my values and influence where I can. Because I have seen people in this country doing business in a very difficult situation mm -hmm. and sticking to their values. Eh? And in the process, they lose. There's an issue here of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're aiming for something good, it's inevitable you will sacrifice something, right? Mm -hmm. Now the question is, how many people are willing to sacrifice? Mm -hmm. Because if we all jump into that rotten fish tank, okay, and say there is no nothing good that can work here, and I therefore let's join, mm -hmm. then we become a chaotic country. Mm 
mm. okay. which has very little hope in terms of the future. Okay. So I think coming back to your, your point, Ken, um, in a context where we have these tsunami waves of corruption, I mean, something like 8,000 economic criminal uh, crimes that are going through our courts at the moment, ethical leadership will be a minority. That's, let's be clear, right? Because the ethical base of our society has not transformed. Now, we know from history, the mad men and mad women of history, um, that uh, that has always been the case. Jesus was not a normal person in the context of the context of the society in which he lived. Martin Luther King was actually uh, understood to have been a, a slightly uh, mentally disturbed person by Ipsos, the equivalent of Ipsos um, uh, opinion polls in the 1950s and 60s. Less than 15% of the population thought he was doing the right thing. I am sure if you did a demographic analysis, they would have all been black people. The point of this is, let me give you one more. Ma, uh, Wangari Madai, who won the Nobel laureate, who we now reference everything from environmental conservation to human rights to democracy, was not a popular woman when she lived. But I think another thing that's kind of interesting for me is all those three have one thing in common, which is that it is really the last 10 years of their lives that they became the leaders that we now know them for. Now, what does this tell us? It means that every single leader that we see on our television screen, who is either part of the Tanga Tanga, the uh, Kileweke, or the Katikati Kati group, if I can use that uh, phrase, um, all of them have the capacity to be able to redeem themselves, find a center of gravity that is in the interest of this country, and begin to lead rather than to deal make. Right. Last point, very last point, and uh, I'm saying this part <coughs> because I will need to leave in a few minutes. Unfortunately, um, uh, I had another uh, an appointment here. But the, the, the other thing that I wanted to say is, during the presidential debates of 2017, um, and I think, can you remember those a little bit uh, intimately, one of, one of the things that I asked the presidential candidates, I said, if you do not win, what will you do? And after the show, a couple of them came up to me and said, Irungo, what kind of a question is that? And I said, actually, that is your blind spot as politicians. Public service is completely linked to public salaries. You cannot serve the public unless you're in a public office. And my, my, my challenge to all of us now is to see public service as something that happens regardless of whether you're a state officer, whether you're elected or nominated, or whether you're appointed in public office. If you start that way, then actually you are able to provide leadership for this country and that going into a public office essentially is just another platform for you to work from. So as we move into this group of conversations about who will be the next leaders, let's look at very carefully what people are doing outside of what we pay them to do. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we're taking a short break. When we come back, I'd like to give you an example. I'd like us to work our conversation around my example of the young people uh, study that was done by the Aga Khan Foundation and the influence. Because the young people, if you did random sampling, random questioning of the young people and asked them, what would you want to be first? Before they mention professional, they'll mention politician, right? And then you ask them, but why? They'll give you a profound answer. I'd like to discuss that, right? Let's take a break right here on AM Live. We'll be back with the Leadership Forum. And uh, welcome back to AM Live. Today is Friday and it's the Leadership Forum. And this morning, fortunately, we're also discussing about leadership from across the board. We have, we have learned about the quality, uh, quality of leaders we desire unfortunately we don't have those leaders or very few of them and uh, the question is that why are we not having the best people coming out uh, to offer themselves for the position of leadership unfortunately again when we look at leadership we look at it in terms of politics and uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, my question to begin this session is one related to what was brought up by uh, Teresa about uh, the quality of leaders and the people who don't offer themselves for these positions. But again, I'd like to begin from the point of view that Nerima spoke about. Um, where do we begin? Do we begin like you looked at it from 1994? Fortunately, you bundled us all there. <laughs> um, how comes the most desired job in this country right now, even among the youth, is politics? And the question that we usually ask is, why politics to these young people? And what they tell you, it's the quickest way to get out of poverty. Yeah, it is. Because yes. if you look at MCAs, 
they just have one term. They've left with cars, they've left with a house, they even have biasharas. So why not? And it's one of those where I just need to do this for five, four years. And by the time I leave, I have enough to even raise a family. And, and that's what youth are looking at. And it's unfortunate because at the same time, can you blame them? Because if you even say, let me graduate, there's one million of you graduating. And then let me try and get a job. People tarmac for two plus years and then even end up in a job that they didn't even do in school to be in. So you have a person who's frustrated and they've lost hope in systems and they're wondering, why am I here? And then you hear government say, create opportunities. But then to even start a business is expensive to start one. You don't have access to capital. You can't even get a loan at a bank. So you're stuck in this corner where you're forced to find solutions that maybe people think are not conventional and they'll say it's immoral. But at the end of the day, when you measure what's put forth where you have, yes, people entering politics for a short period of time, but being able to make something out of it, you will go for that. I don't want to lose the point of the young people, but I, 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 I wanted to ask also, is this also a problem with the society, how the society uh, looks at people and how the people in the society want to be in the society. Depends on who is looking at it because uh, like we've had here, I mean, there are some good people in this country. Not everybody is looking at that kind of life. Yeah. And that is are where... Are you sure? Absolutely. absolutely. And that is where what else, we need what to else change. Are they looking? It's not material. I mean, for a lot of people, for a lot, for a lot of us, it's not just what it is that you can, you know, amass within that short time. There are some good leaders in this country. and. Um, Yuton, I uh, talked about Martin Luther, he talked about uh, Wangari Mathai, and said yes, it's during their last 10 years that we saw them for what they represent. And he said that the current crop we have can redeem themselves. But my question is, could we even equate them to those, you know, kind of leaders, the Wangaris to the Mahatma Gandhis? Absolutely not. So we need people that we can emulate, you know? Okay. Today there are things we say, if only Wangari was around, these things could not have happened. We need to be saying, Hilton is around, so these things are not what happening, happened? you okay. know? So let's have more of that, they are there. Okay. We if, cannot try I'll give Irungu an opportunity because I know he has to leave in a few minutes also to reflect on this. So I think uh, it's a great conversation. So one of the biggest scientific um, conversations of, uh, I guess, the last decade is whether fish in water feel wet, <laughs> right? And I, I, I was reflecting on it in the context of uh, corruption and where we're at as a country. And actually, I wondered, as citizens, do we recognize the impact of corruption on our lives and unethical leadership? And I think in many ways we don't. We're like that fish in the water. We continue to swim, breathe, and uh, assume that everything will be okay. But actually, we do not have the experience of being connected to a society that is crumbling under the weight of unethical leadership and corruption. And I think and once we wake up, things will begin to shift. Now, you asked a question, um, and I think, uh, Pamela, you raised this issue about uh, Martin Luther King and so on. You know, these three individuals were actually everyday individuals. Jesus was a carpenter. Martin Luther King was one, was a Baptist minister, of which there were thousands across the United States of America. Wangari Madai was, yes, one of the first scientists in the, in the East African context, probably even Africa, a woman scientist, but she was actually a scientist. She was a normal human being going to work like any one of us that is watching this program right now. The difference, the distinction that made them leaders is that they decided to be disruptive, bold, and transformative. Consistent. Now, this is the question, and we have this choice every morning. Every one of us can decide, today, am I going to be mediocre, uh, be a hustler, be a deal maker, or am I going to be transformative? And we can make those choices. Let me give you three um, people that I met last year, um, so that we don't think we're just talking about the, the first century and uh, the 1960s and uh, the 1980s. Um, last year, um, I met a young man called Jordan Dudley. He's 30, I think 32 years of age. He's just gone into his, uh, um, uh, his first job. He works at Katiba Institute. And in the first year, he prosecuted, I think, four public interest cases, of which had an impact on a whole range of issues, including the right to bail and the, right of arrest, uh, the, the rights of arrested persons. Or take the story of Carlton Minor, 
the late Carlton Miner, the Kibra University, the Kibra um, resident and Leeds University student. Now Carlton struggled against all the odds that he was given. Yeah. Right? He grew out of an economy that basically uh, criminalized him as a young man, had given him no opportunities in studies, and he won two bursaries. He was in Leeds University, came home, and found himself um, dead at the end of a police bullet, in fact, five bullets. Now, his family and the families of Evans Joroge and the families of all the 200 other young people um, that have to get up after their children are shot by police officers, those are acts of courage. Every single one of the Kibra um, uh, displaced people um, when uh, in June last year, the, uh, what did they call them? The Sunny. It was called Sunny. That's the first time, although middle class people didn't realize that Sunny existed until it started uh, affecting Java and Keleleshwa. But Sunny was active in Kibra uh, back in June and July. Every one of those families, I'm sure, went and found another home and rebuilt their lives. And I suspect their children also went to school in the last term. So the point I'm making is that all around us, there are remarkable people doing extraordinary things. Mm. Um, but they are everyday people. The difference is that we don't recognize them. They are not going to be on the commendation list of the mm -hmm. heads of state commendation. And my question is, when will we start acknowledging these people and more importantly, start speaking greatness to them so that that greatness shows up? Good question. Good question. I, really, I really love those examples <coughs> of ordinary people exercising leadership at their place, at their sphere of influence. And that's what we're all called to do. Okay? And those people are driven by value system of service. Right. And I think that's the difference that they make because they want to serve. And I like what you said. It's not only about the material. Materialism is a value, <laughs> right? Which is a dominant value, but not everybody embraces it. There are other spiritual values like service, okay? Where you say, I, want to, I, I, I am aware that I have a role to play in this society and I want to leave it better than I found it. So I'm going to serve. And it seems that this particular value has been becoming less and less over the years. So as we say, as we advance materially and technologically and all those things, we are diminishing as people, as human beings, because our values become more material. And I think, in my view personally, the real satisfaction which people like Wangari Mathai had is that they led a meaningful life. Right. And in fact, if, they look, if, if, if we want to find people who are happy are those who, who have certain spiritual values, not just material values. Because you can have all the billions in the world, have all the helicopters to drive you, to take you from A to B, and show off to everybody else that yeah. you're better than them. But it's unlikely that you will be fulfilled as a person. Mm. Um, uh, about the people that uh, remain unknown, you yeah. know, the ones that uh, Hilton has talked about, how can they be brought to the fore? Because yeah. they need to be recognized. recognized yeah. I mean, Ken, you need to bring them on this panel. The mm. media needs to start talking about them, give them more, you know, limelight, so that you have less of the noise makers, mm. you know, mm. and more of people who are making great contribution to this country. I would like to challenge the media houses because they know these people are there. Yeah. Please, yeah. let's have their voices. Yeah. Uh, just, just yesterday, uh, we had quite a hearing in this country, uh, Priscilla Acharya, uh, Acharya versus Acharya, mm -hmm. which is a famous case that most people have used for uh, matrimonial property, and it's a, a battle that Kenya is still... Uh, struggling with especially uh, spouses who feel they make a contribution in their marriages but it's not being recognized. I think we had quite some good coverage. At first when I was calling in uh, uh, media houses, I was like, is this newsworthy? Right. But I was so pleased that it was newsworthy. So we can get there. We, we can get there because I think all uh, media houses got to write something about her. It's unfortunate that we are writing so much about her, yet she started in 1968, mm. the battle. 1987, her first judgment, 2001, her second judgment. But 2019, she leaves mm -hmm. us still, you know, struggling on this particular issue. But at least those are part of uh, leadership that we can uh, recognize. So, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and just to add also, I, 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 I often uh, run leadership workshops. And one of the questions I ask the participants, which leaders do you really admire in this country? And there are some particular names mm -hmm. that regularly come up. And the first thing I ask them is, in public service, which leaders do you really admire? They struggle. <laughs> <laughs> but there are certain names that come up regularly. One of them is um, uh, Mr. Matiangi in his education reform process. Okay. The other one is John Michuki in his transformation, in the mm -hmm. transport yeah, transformation yeah. process. Took a lot of courage, it took, took a lot of, of will to mm -hmm. break these cartels and mm -hmm. change. Those two usually come up in public service. Okay. Wangari Mathayos also comes up because of her struggle with Karura. 
I always say we enjoy Karura because of a person like Wangari who struggled and suffered and sacrificed for it. So there are all these names that keep coming up. But there are so many others, actually, who we do not know about. And I, I, I for example, I find um, there was a lady who was running, uh, headmistress of, um, I think, Kenya High School. Her name was Ms. Wanjoy. She's highly regarded by all her students. And she was there for many years, and those students talk extremely highly of her. Mm -hmm. Geoffrey Griffins in Starehe yeah. was one of the greatest heroes of this country. Starting the NYS and Starehe and working two jobs at the same time, he was a great hero with great value of service. So all these people are there, but I agree we should give them more prominence because these are the real leaders we should be looking for. Okay. And giving them the prominence of them. Okay. Cool. I agree with you. I agree with you entirely. And in fact, Hirongo mentioned uh, the police officer who decided against Absolutely. all order. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to shoot this guy. We yeah. saw the video online. Yeah. It was a single, alone police officer with a gun, probably. The guys in the car were armed, but we saw what he did. So I agree with you entirely. And because you have to leave, I'll give you your last word. So there is a point by um, a poet by the name of Mario, uh, Mario Andrade, and it's called My Soul Has a Heart. There's no time to, uh, to read the whole poem. But the essence of the poem is we have two lives. Our second life starts the moment we realize that we only have one life. What does it mean? It means that if we can bring a sense of intentionality and purpose mm -hmm. to the life that we have been given, then we will live a meaningful life. And this is the, I think, the, the enduring lesson of um, uh, you know, history, which is that those people that we now look to as being change makers were actually everyday people for most of their lives. And at some point, they took a decision that they were, they, they, they came to the realization that they only had one life and they began to live that life with purpose. And I think for me, that's the challenge um, that I would leave the nation this morning. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Irungu. And of course, we continue with our conversation. And the next thing I want to discuss is having identified, having identified all these factors surrounding our leadership, where do we start? Because we have them. We have these leaders. But the question is, the people who are watching and asking, but you have told us and we know we can see. But where do we start? Pam. It's about everyone, you know, being part of the process. You know, when we are looking for leaders, who is that person that you're putting into leadership? Yeah? If we are looking for leaders, are you available to offer yourself for leadership? And even where you are in your local community, what role are you playing? Because you're talking values, which is very important. Um, does that reflect in the things that you do so that the others can also learn from you or you can influence. A leader is an influencer, yeah? Role model. Let's see more people who are doing things that others can emulate. And from that, it will be a ripple effect, you know? So let's not say that, yeah, there is so much rotten bananas around. Um, one good banana is okay. It can work miracles. So let's okay. see the individuals who have something to contribute, who have a calling, who are service-oriented, you know, who are serving above themselves, actually. That should be the motto. Because once you want to lead, it's because you are called to serve. Okay. If you do that, then there will be people, you know, who will be working with you. And that's a kind of maybe momentum that we need to build in this country and not run after these people whom we perceive to be leaders and yet they are not leaders. We should distinguish between the politicians who are there, most of them, I would say, most of them, for different agenda, and the people who are leaders in various spheres, whether it's politics, whether it's corporate, whether it's a civil society, um, or the civil service, and people who can guide this country to where it needs to be. Okay. Let me throw Spanish to the works. Um, <coughs> the Constitution gives us a safety net, recalling our bad leaders. Mm -hmm. I, I wish, sometimes I even start with my, sometimes my county, and I'm like, I wish I could just. Which is your county? Busia <laughs> County. Oh, Busia. Where okay. we've had even our governor being tried for. So for Peter uh, Jumon. Yeah, yes. And I, I, th I try to see even if we could run, even 10 people, it's not easy. So, but I think if Kenyans, we can, I, I don't know which county can try, but 
I wish mine could try that. We just recall some bad leaders because when we put in our constitution, I, I like that constitution because it, it has solutions to, uh, I think, about 99% of our problems, which I recall. Secondly, is it possible that we just shame bad practice mm -hmm. or bad leaders? And when you say possible, we shame. Yes, we, we? We, we start from me, Teresa, okay. and others who believe that we can have leaders of virtues in this country. It breaks my heart. I'll just use one example. When Sharon died, and there are a few of us who came out and said, you have been pointing our governor. There's nothing wrong he did. He's just a suspect. When so many things were out and clear, we shifted our focus on things that didn't matter, but we forgot. And I don't, you know, uh, thankfully, Fida Kenya is still following up on that matter and would want to see the end of it. But can we have people who can, when the leader is wrong, it's okay just to keep quiet and let them go through mm -hmm. the process. But it's not, it's not heroic every time a leader does a bad thing. It's either your tribe being attacked, your people. Mm -hmm. Let's try and tr shame these practices. And we have Kenyans who do it. It's just that maybe like Kurungu said, they're only one or less than 15% in the okay. population. Yeah. I would suggest, uh, and I think the points that have been raised are very valid, but I would look at two approaches. One is what I call the long-term approach. The long-term approach needs to be one of true education and values. I don't think we have an option on that. And that starts in the home, where parents need to be present and educate their children in values. And the schools have got to continue passing on those values. And then the society itself, through the visible leaders, need to pass on those values. I don't think we have a shortcut there. We have to rebuild this society through values. Second is the short-term, and I think she's mentioned partly uh, one of the short-term strategies. But I recall reading the history of the Great Plague in the 14th century. I don't know if you people are aware that in the 14th century, the Great Plague killed between 150 million to 200 million people in Europe. It almost wiped out Europe. And I was reflecting on this history I was reading with the, with the corruption plague in this country and in Africa in general. It is killing millions of people. People are dying trying to cross the Mediterranean to go to Europe. People are dying from hunger. People are dying from diseases which they should not be dying for. People are dying from accidents. It's because of this corruption plague. Okay? Now, how did they deal with that great plague to stop it? You know what they did? They got all those who were infected and violated their rights and isolated them. Because that was the only way they were going to stop it. Mm -hmm. Now here, because we're such a right-based democratic society, we don't violate anybody's rights. But when we have a major problem on our hands, we should think about saying that it is better to violate the rights of a few people for the sake of the majority. Yep. And we need to say that if you are caught with certain crimes, there shall be no bail, for example, which we say is our right. Because people are walking scot-free, they have billions of shillings in the bank, but they are stopping even investigations, and they don't explain how they got those billions in the bank. But we're saying this is their right. So we are highly confused in this regard, and I think we need to take a bit more punitive measures to have sanctions against those who are destroying this country through their bad behavior, corruption, theft, murder, and all sorts of things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we have to be very deliberate about yeah, absolutely. this. Absolutely. I remember uh, before Nerima speaks, the time the president had, uh, uh, there used to be conferences at State House. Yeah. Then there was a time there was the, was it the anti-corruption conference? Yeah, we talk. Where um, he asked, what do you want me to do? And even quipped, um, he asked, do you want me to arraign them at Uhuru Park and so, shoot them? <laughs> so that's what you're proposing, Dr. No, I'm saying you have to <laughs> be more drastic. Punitive. I'm saying, yeah, what I'm that. saying, the Great Plague <laughs> killed almost 200 million people. This plague is killing us here yes. in this country. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. And we have to treat it with the urgency. It is a war we have. It's like an aggressor. An external country, one of our neighbors, attacking us and killing our people. But here we have the, the enemy is within us. <laughs> you understand? We need to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nerima. Yeah. I, I agree that we do need to deal with it. Just because for us, the intentionality that Irungu was talking about, to wake up with intention, it means you have hope. And right now, corruption is killing hope of young people. And so for them to wake up with the desire to make their country better, the environment must be conducive to allow them to do that. But corruption eradicates that from young people. So I think for us to be able to build ourselves, for young people to have hope and build this country, yes, systems must affirm 
and si systems and institutions must be able to support that. And so even to hear Teresa talking about that case going uh, institution affirmed, and that's what young people need, institutions to affirm them. And that would mean us following up with our systems. It's not that we don't know. We are fully aware of the systems that exist. They're just not followed. They're just not implemented. And those are the conversations that we need to have. And I agree in terms of highlighting individuals who are practicing these things. But I've also seen people who say they've tried a simple thing like traffic, where people are not following the rules of traffic and they go using the other way, especially politicians. Mm -hmm. And someone has tried to stop. And people just watch. We don't follow. And again, when it comes to leadership, it takes boldness. And it has to take a time where Kenyans say, enough is enough. We need this for the betterment of our country, and we need to support one another in doing that cause. And, and how, will we, <clears throat> sorry, how will we get to that point that people actually realize enough is enough and do something about it? What does it take to get to that point? Now? I think we're already heading there, where things become so difficult, where we're talking about hardly being able to afford our food, where we're seeing in the news yesterday a mother committed suicide because she wasn't sure she was going to be able to pay for her child's school fees, and her child did well. Her mother felt pressure that I cannot even give my child the future I promised her with a good education. The child did her part. She passed. The mother couldn't meet that. And so when you're seeing that all the news is showing us of these cases of people fighting over land, fighting over 20 shillings, this is showing us that people are struggling internally. And this is only going to be a matter of time as our politicians continue to bicker and banter, people are going to say enough is enough. I think we're going to see it. I do, I believe that. Okay. I think also uh, the other thing, um, like I started from the beginning, the show and even now I'll still insist, our institutions can also help us. In this particular situation, like when the president asks, what should I do? If we have a judicial system that processes these cases on, you know like presidential elections, when you dispute them, there's a certain time that you have to hear them, uh, complete and give a judgment, days. 14 days. Mm -hmm. Can we have for corruption cases also 14 days or something closer to that? Because if people see these matters are being processed and people are, are being held accountable, there are punitive measures being put in place, then I will not shy away from, from being able to call out a corrupt uh, public officer or or whoever else. But if I know, even if I report, we are going to be in court for four years, three years, for any other matter, not only corruption, but every other issue, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, even that mother, if she knew that she could go to court and get custody and maintenance from the father of the child if the father of the child is around, and she knows she can get this within a month or two, I don't think There's suicide would be. Yeah. yeah, but our options are so limited because all institutions are either not independent enough or they're not doing what is expected. It's as much as, yes, we've had, they're trying to clear the backlog, but if we could isolate some of these cases, the plagues of yeah, our country, and say, if this one comes within this number of days, it's out. And I think Kenyans will have confidence and know that there's somewhere I can complain and something will be done about it. Mm. But if we continue with the way we are, then it's really frustrating. Even for me as a lawyer, I get so frustrated. I can see a woman has really a case. I know this is her right, but I... The first thing I start telling her is, Mama, you know, be patient. Do you have other social support? This will not finish this year. I think when we look at our diary, like by last year, September, the earliest date you could get was February, April this year. So what am I telling that poor woman? You know, so I think the institutions, we can start from our institutions. Okay. Yeah. And uh, of course, uh, knowing that um, a leader um, must be confident to take whatever drastic measures to right the so many wrongs that we have yeah. in this country. Uh, that's the least that we can expect uh, so that we are not um, waiting for the apocalypse or taking the people to Hurupak and shooting them. That's not going to happen about the delivery of services. You know, whatever, whatever position one is in is about delivering services, whether it's in the civil society. We are hearing complaints all the time about immigration. You know, when you're looking for a passport, all institutions have a service. So it's a delivery charter. It tells you within this time, you get this service. But what happens? Weeks down the line, you are still following up. Why is that so? Because people haven't accepted that they are put into position, whatever position it is. Let's not even think at the top ones. Whatever it is that you are serving the public, that is a position 
um, a leadership position because you are in control of a service. So we need to get back even as citizens to make those demands and make them loudly. And for the leadership in those institutions uh, to take note of the complaints that are coming up and deal with the individuals because we can't just let it be and move on like nothing is happening. It's about the value system again. Okay. It's about delivering services. That's leadership. I'll ask you the same question I asked Nirima. At what point will the citizens realize that? At what I, point? Have they not realized? I'm a citizen. I've realized that. You know? But how many are we? How many are we? How many people have realized? I, I think when you listen to the citizens in this country today, I mean, people are aware that it's not okay, you know? So what we need is maybe to governize this effort and maybe speak louder mm -hmm. and get everybody really to just take a claim in the way things are done in this country. Uh, Unless we raise our voices louder, it's not going to happen. I think there's an area of comfort for citizens. Yeah. So long as it doesn't affect me, yeah. I'm okay with it. Yes. I want to comment on that because I agree totally with you, especially the middle class is very comfortable in this country. So long as they have their job or their business, their car, their golf club, they're okay. But if we are to galvanize, and I like the word galvanize and mobilize the citizens of this country, we need those who are, are aware, and I'm talking about those who are aware, include especially those who are on this panel, the media, and all those people who are aware, to be aware that it is our responsibility. Okay, every day we need to educate at least one, two, three, four, five people at an individual level. Imagine if 12,000 people educated 1,000 people each in the next three, four, five years, for example. We would then have educated 12 million people in this country. And that is almost a, hard, a large percentage of the voters in this country. But it has to start with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven here and others. And that can be done. But it has to be intentional. It has to be a daily process where we feel it's our responsibility. And if you recall, before President Obama was elected in 2008, in America there was a saying that no black person can be elected a president of the United States. Yeah. The way President Obama was elected was by ordinary people saying, yes, we can. And there was a huge mobilization effort from ordinary people, including a bit of contribution, eh? who said, we want the best person, it doesn't matter whether they're black, white, yellow, whatever the case is, and he was elected. And the impossible became possible. In this country, what we think is impossible, a clean, well-governed country by somebody who can be trusted is possible. But we have to go through a major mobilization and galvanization process, which starts with each and every one of us. Uh, I just want to you know the question of comfortable yeah. and, and despair. I am with Nelima. Yeah. I think we have lost hope. Not that we, we are comfortable. You yeah. know, he mentioned about the middle class. Then I was like, mm, I think I'm there. Then when he mentioned <laughs> exactly. what is that? Yeah, the yeah. then when he mentioned the middle class, I was like, no, no, no. That's not my area. Yeah. Squash club. Yeah. <laughs> because the middle, that whoever is middle class or whoever uh, at whatever yeah. point, yeah. you are still the same one who gets calls from your village. Mm. Yeah. This person has not gone to school. So you're not only taking care of your family, True. but there's, mm. you know, there's all this other community you're looking at and you get so you're, you're also really struggling right but when i go to the supermarket and yesterday i bought unga at 120 now it's 165 what do i do do i scream in the supermarket or what you know una, mm. you know you, you just choose now i, I came here for two packets mm. now I, I can only pick one and go out but that doesn't mean that i'm happy mm. and but it's because i i don't know where else to go to and that's why i keep saying where can we go Let's go to these politicians, recall them. Let's go to this institution and tell them, look here, we have to try and move these things. And there are people who are doing it. We might not be hundreds, our voice might not be so loud, but I think what you're calling on Kenyans now, even as we are in this show, wherever you are, yes, we agree, you're, you're feeling hopeless. Maybe you even think, oh, Teresa, you're just talking. After this TV show, you go back to your work and continue. But if you can just stop and say, I can actually stand up, and ask a question yeah. to whoever is supposed to deliver for me. Immigration, you said 21 days. Can I see someone? Trust you me, sometimes people get shocked. Who is this who is asking to see the supervisor? 
Sometimes, and you're just nobody, a farmer's child or whoever. But because of the fear of they only think those who ask why are the people who are who, who is who, you why get what you want and move on. Mm -hmm. So we are hope, feeling the, uh, we are having the feeling of hope, hopelessness. It's not comfort okay. from where I am. I, I have a question for her yeah. because she's mentioned a recall. Before you excite people watching about recalling, yes. as a lawyer, you know, it's really difficult. <laughs> they made it difficult for us to do that. Yes, but no. are, aren't we the same citizens who have voted for the same constitution? So instead and of being reactional, to, yes. we need to start it before we vote them in. Yes. Because even recalling them is being reactional. Mm -hmm. Yes, reacting. I agree. No, yes. I, I agree. We yeah. can as well start before. But haven't we started before and still, I go back, IBC will still pass these people. Even when, I say this because practically I know we have produced a complaint over because they, they, these people will come and to they, you as a lawyer mm -hmm. and you represent they them in the court and you talk about <laughs> <laughs> talk about my rights, my rights, and my rights, oh. and then okay, yes, maybe then we start with our profession, yes. But I know there are also good lawyers mm -hmm. out there mm -hmm. who have actually said you can't. You know, like, I, I mean, I'm just falling short of mentioning names. We went and said, look, this person can't, regardless of whoever you, you I mean, whatever system or criteria you use, but voila, they I'm are still in the, in the election, uh, okay. I mean, the ballot papers. Yeah, yeah uh, sorry, I, just, I, I heard the word hopeless. And I want to emphasize, hopeless is a choice we make at a personal level, okay. right? And I think we need to really be reflective on ourselves and what, how we live. Hope is one of the things, if you don't have hope, then, then you, you're literally not expecting anything in the future. You're literally dead, yet alive. You understand? So what I want to suggest, and uh, Teresa, you mentioned that word hopeless. I think we cannot afford to be hopeless when we are alive. We cannot afford to be hopeless when we're in a, such a bad place in this country, yet we are so privileged to be educated in this country, most likely a taxpayer's cost, because some of us went to public schools, etc., etc. We cannot afford. But that message has got to be sent out to more and more of us. As much as those people in the rural areas are asking us for a helping hand, ABC, we also have a responsibility to educate them on how they can help themselves by electing good leaders. So we have to be the voter educators. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> All right? Not just the city dwellers who send out handouts to people who are in need. And we explain to them that you are in need because of the hopeless policies that have been put in place by the leaders we have selected who go sit in the Legislative Assembly to create or lobby for parks for themselves. Understand? So we educate the people. And I keep saying, if 12,000 people can educate 1,000 people each, that's 12 million people. We have to do it in those small pockets. That is what is possible. And this is from President Obama's campaign. This is how it worked. The impossible became possible because more people carried the burden. And people who were not bystanders and spectators, they were actually participating in the governance of their country. And, and that's I think what that's what we, we have to get to. That's what we are in this country, by, standard, yeah. uh, by standards and spectators. Yeah. We look, so long as it doesn't affect me, I'll go back to that. that is what, do well, what do I care? A <laughs> civic education doesn't have to be organized. I mean, you can yeah. do it at Yourself. your own level. Yeah. You know, one person, yeah. you know, exactly. and you influence Absolutely. others. That is the point I'm making. Pole pole. It is, civic education is not an organized process by the IBC Civic Education Department. No. It is by all those, Nerima here, Teresa here, who are enlightened enough to realize what is better for this country, and then some people living in a bit of ignorance can be helped by individuals going out. Today, we can make a resolution that I'm going to educate one person. If we do that for 365 days, that's 365 people. <laughs> you understand? Mm -hmm. Maybe we can do two, three, four, five. But if we're 10,000, 20,000 of us, we're reaching out to millions of people. And that is how change has taken place in the past, in, in other places. Eh? As, as, as regular panelists, do you get frustrated? First, do you ask yourself, at the end of, I'm getting this from what she said, at the end of saying all these things, what happens? What impact do I make? Yeah. Does someone listen to me? Is someone taking this? Is someone going to really work with what I'm saying? Of course, remember? it gets yeah. frustrating because, sorry, uh, because you see the same things happening all the time. You wished there could be change. Yeah, and that is why I'm talking about that drastic change that needs to be made by the people we are put into, uh, we've given responsibility to lead. Yeah? Unless that happens, then the frustra frustration is there. It's obvious. I'll do my bit. Uh, everybody will do their part. But somebody needs to wield that stick. Yes. Change, change is slow, um, but I do receive a lot of messages from youth all over the country. And we do do civic education. 
And it's something that we do constantly, not before an election, we do it every day. Mm -hmm. And I do see young people come even to us and ask, teach me so I can go and teach others. So I think it does make an impact, especially for me, I would say when people see how young I am and how concerned I am about the country, they begin to ask, maybe I should be asking those questions as well. Or I've asked them, but I don't really feel there's anybody out there like me. And so it's good to have people who can identify with you, and it's not necessarily people who are professionals, professors, and politicians. Mm -hmm. People who are also in my bracket of age, it could be my friend next door. So it does make a difference. I think that people do begin to question and participate because okay. they're seeing there's someone else doing it. And if that doesn't happen, there's some fatigue that sets in. Oh, yeah. How yeah. do we deal with that fatigue? How do, do we, especially civil society, mm. how do we deal with it? Uh, l let me use one uh, example that we all know, the two-thirds gender principle in this country. I mean, uh, I remember last year Kenya was reporting, because Kenya is also a signatory to CEDO, CEDO is the Convention on uh, uh, Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, and every country has to report to the international world, what are you doing about women rights in your country? And when we went there in front of these gracious commissioners and all that, one of them just asked us, what do you actually want us to write in the report? Because it is in your constitution, you have five judgments in your country. And he actually looked straight, uh, and actually at FIDA panel, you know, and said, so exactly, tell us the exact words you want us to put in the recommendation for your country. And we said, give us 24 hours, because you have, t you're given about 24 hours to, to give more recommendations for the letter to be given. And after 24 hours, we really didn't have what to say, because truth be told we have done you said everything every, we've been up to the supreme court mm -hmm. and so we, we came back with the answer and some people said oh you know the problem with you is that you always just go to the street you always make noise try boardroom discussion and with the executive all kenyans know we've even done that we've published all the courtesy calls we've had with these executives we've even written a public letter on daily newspapers you know so what am I again saying institutions? At this point now, this is the executive institution. Just do the right thing. Yeah. Because now what else can Teresa do? Like he, uh, maybe the president asked, should I shoot them? Now even me, I feel like asking, should I shoot my leaders? That's you know, fatigue. You That's know, fatigue. But That's <laughs> now how do we deal with this? Is that we've now just tried to get more and more people to speak about it because it reached a point where it was, oh, those noisy women again, here they are back. So we are trying to get other people try to get maybe male uh, uh, champions of that uh, principle to, to speak about it. But I can tell you, if we continue like this, they'll also get fatigued. I don't know who else, where else will go. So for me, it's still just to call upon the leaders of specific institutions, where the decision lies. Just be bold and make the right decision in whatever. Two-thirds is just one example, but there are so many other things in okay, this country. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and you mentioned that very many things in this country, and uh, sometimes we somehow are dealing with so many things that we are not effective in anything. I suspect that is where we are at in this country. And we are a very good democratic country, so maybe we allowed that space to deal with so many issues. But the current issue that I think the president has been trying to deal with is an issue of unity and corruption. Two very pressing priorities affecting everybody in this country. And I think there's been some bold steps taken in that regard. So personally, I have hope. Okay. Personally, I don't think we should be fatigued. Personally, I think a lot of progress has been made. Even just from the TV clips that we saw earlier, there was a lot of acrimony at one time, and now there is relative calm, okay? And business is improving. There are more tourists coming to our shores because of some bold steps that have been taken. And, the, and even those bold steps have caused acrimony and disruption in Jubilee. So what I'm saying is I think change has been taking place Change has taken place, in fact, in this country phenomenally since 1980s. And a lot of good things have happened. So personally, I think I'm very hopeful. And that has happened because of many people of courage who have stood up to say, we need to change. I don't compare ourselves to too many other countries. But in Africa, we're one of the leading countries in terms of good progress in terms of change. I think we are. There are some countries which are basket cases of corruption, where nothing works. Nothing works. They have governors, they have all sorts of things, arrangements, they have constitutions and laws that don't work. But in this country, I think things are improving. And I think we still have to just continue with that trend, and I think things will still get better. So we should not be fatigued, because we live once, as my good friend Hutton was saying. We live once. So what is the problem? 
we're here. Let's do the best we can do now and keep moving. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And I think okay. that's what we're doing. And I, I'm glad the media is also taking this up. Mm -hmm. I'm delighted always that the media reports on the corruption cases. And this has been fantastic pressure on the corrupt. Because they will never forget they're corrupt when they read the newspapers. And that is very good, eh? Because the next time they think of becoming corrupt, they think twice. Mm -hmm. So you've been sensitizing the consciousness, the conscience of many people. And I can tell you for a fact that is good positive change. Because there was a time the media was a bit quiet on these issues, a bit shy, eh? But now they've said no. We're going for this. And television and print media has done very well on this. Okay. So I think change has been positive. Yeah. Great. But you need also to distinguish when it is uh, corruption, it's corruption. When it's uh, looting of public resources, we need to call it looting yeah. so that it's not always corruption. It's a plain. Yeah? <laughs> it's plain looting. Uh, but going back to what it is that we can do, um, it's really about respecting the Constitution as it is. And we have seen in some uh, counties in this country. I have been around a lot and I, I know there are places of being involved in the processes. And I know there are places in this country where citizens are so enlightened. They demand, they make demands of their leaders. There are other places where they are so fearful of leadership, they just cannot talk. We need to get to counties like those or to people who still think that uh, their leaders can load it over them and they just sit back. Um, maybe that is where now, um, you know, a lot of, um, you know, civic education needs to take root so that as we move on, we can get better leadership. I'll tell you again that there are places in this country where we have uh, citizens are able to elect good leaders mm. because they are more enlightened. Mm. We need to get to a place where as many of us in this country have gotten to that level. Yeah. That point, I'm still looking at that point. You know, I have been in this country long enough <laughs> to realize that even the things, you know, when I, I, I listen to you speak, and at the back of my mind, I'm still thinking, how are we going to do this? At what point will we even think we have done it? It's not so bad, and it's, you shouldn't um, sort of like want to give up on it, yeah? I mean the fatigue, <laughs> yeah. the fatigue. We Even reporting corruption. Tired. Let let me give you an example yeah. of what what uh, Dr. mentioned. Yeah. Reporting corruption. You know now, the leaders are so scared that I think yesterday and today is the worst day. They don't know. Are we getting arrested today? Am I getting? Am I spending the weekend? But even before we got to this point, did you see how much we had to do? But again, I realized it only took two people to do this, right? So at, even the, about the leadership and everything that happened, that fatigue, at what point? Because one, they are elected. At what point will we get to that place that we know we have done it? I think for the first thing is, um, how did we even get there, you know? Which we have discussed. Yeah, I'll tell you. Yes. How did we get there? First of all, it's because I, for me, I see too much of resources you know around and people not even knowing how to manage them we got people into places of leadership and they were not ready for it that was one major problem so that you come into this office and you really don't even know what you've come in to do and that starts you know getting things going wrong all over the place so right now we have that crisis and we've got to go back to the values. It may sound hypothetical, but we've got to go back to that, even as Kenyans, and seek to be led by people who deserve to be in leadership. How are we going to get there? We have to ask ourselves. Each one of us is responsible for getting the right people in place. Yeah. Okay, Nerima. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we'll know when we get there when an example, a politician goes to a public rally or a campaign or anything, and the agenda is set by the people. That's how we'll know we got there. Not politicians going and speaking about whatever they want to talk about, whether it's 22, whatever, whatever. But when people say, no, 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 no. Start as we, we have our own agenda, mm -hmm. you speak to us. to us. That's how we'll know we'll get there. We've seen it a couple of mm -hmm. times. Eh? Mm -hmm. We've seen it a couple of times, but it's going to come. That's how we know we've gotten there. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Yeah, just to add also, um, and I, I might defer a little bit, the question of getting there. You know, when you climb something like Mount Kenya, you get to the top of the mountain, and that's it, okay? I don't think we'll ever get there, mm -hmm. because we're human beings, 
and we're dealing with what I call a divergent challenge, okay, which has no mathematical solution. What it requires is more and more people to be committed. Okay? And when more and more people are committed, we will move to a better space. That's how you deal with divergent challenges. You never solve them fully. You can even look at the most developed countries in this, in this, in this world. They still have elements of corruption. They're still working on it. It's work in progress. But we have very good examples in this country. We have 47 counties right now as we speak. If I ask you a simple question, in those 47 counties, which governors can you really trust as being servant leaders? Would you be able to answer that question? I suspect we could. Probably with two names or one. Isn't it? One or two names. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or three names even. Isn't it? We could. So what I'm saying is we have role models. And if we can increase the number of role models in governor positions, then we have improved as a country. Okay. You understand? But we'll never solve all the problems. Mm -hmm. But we can move to a better space when we start answering these questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And it's all about those people who choose to decide to serve and lead. Who become deliberate yeah. about yeah, it. Yeah, deliberate about it. Yeah. Okay. All right. We have a few minutes on the clock. And as we end, I'd like you to comment about two things. Mm -hmm. Leadership comes from God. And secondly, we get the leaders we deserve. So uh, uh, we'll just do a round. We have about uh, five, six minutes. I'll begin with you, Teresa. Well, yes, okay. on the two. Leadership comes from God. Well, yes. That's quite uh, religious. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I, I want to believe that, you, like they say, there are some who are born, there are some who are made. And if uh, we all believe in a supreme uh, power, then there are those who are born with it, and it comes from there. And there are those who actually, with time, you grow and, and, and become a good leader. And of course, everybody, whatever you believe in, also has some spiritual guidance to make you a good leader. We deserve the leaders we elect. Uh, I'll, I'll go back to my first example. Sometimes, as Teresa, I've gone to the ballot box. I mean, to the, I've seen the ballot paper. And I know... Oh, the bananas. Yeah, I, I look here and I'm just like, no, really. All right. Seriously. Uh -huh. But uh -huh. here I am. You have to make have a been, choice. Yes, and yes. I've been throughout the 47 counties telling women, please wake up in the morning, go and vote because you need the change. And my value tells me, you cannot come, look at this paper, close it empty, and put it back. You have to make a choice. So I don't think I should be uh, victimized or even told, you know, that bad woman rep you have, that bad governor you have, you elected her. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the question is, what choice did, did you I have? have? Yes. And did I do something to make sure that this choice does, does not get here? So for me, the minute I know I tried and did something, then at that point I'll, I'll make a choice out of that. But not necessarily that that could be the leader that I wanted or I chose. Okay. In December I hosted a panel here of politicians. And one of the politicians who was sitting here told me that uh, he's not going to run for the fourth term. Yes. He's a three-time member of parliament. Yes. However, he told me if this other person runs, because I need to <laughs> save my people, I will run again. <laughs> so his choice of running will be informed by the decision uh, whether someone who he doesn't like or he doesn't believe can take his constituents to the next level run. So that's what will inform. And he's sure he'll beat him because he's beaten him three times. <laughs> so that's the only reason he'll run. Lectari. Yeah. Okay, the phrase leadership comes from God, very common phrase. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned the word God because personally I believe that he's the creator of all of us and we're made in his image. And therefore, any aspirations in our hearts should be in alignment with what he desires for us. And I think he desires good for all of us. Okay? Now, it is very strange, therefore, when leaders desire good only for themselves and bad things for other people. And that surely cannot be coming from God. I think that is my view. Because I think God is good, God is love. And when people do not show that love and that goodness, then surely there is something wrong. And, and that is perhaps fake leadership. But true. There are good desires that can be put in us to help us to lead better because God is good and God is love. And I think in leadership, we need to exercise that love as part of our leadership. If we get to the point of where we get the leaders we deserve, I don't think, I don't think at all that uh, we deserve some of the leaders that we have. And why am I saying that? It is beyond our control. One, we live in a very unequal and poor country, right? And unfortunately, many people are driven by fear of poverty and fear of exclusion. 
And that is why tribalism has thrived in this country, fear of exclusion. And in that poverty state, and, and somehow not knowing who to turn to, they seek a messiah, and tribalism comes in, and corruption comes in. And therefore, we end up with leaders who we really do not deserve. I don't think we deserve those leaders. Mm. But we need to fix up our What country. if you elect them the first and the second and the third time? It happens, it is because of this problem that we have. We have a structural problem where there is such in-depth poverty and so much fear in the people that it's very difficult to break that unless we address their material needs first. You know, and it's very good this uh, issue of trying to give them housing and trying to create jobs for them. All this is very important. And we really need to focus on that so that people can live lives of dignity and be able to become independent entities as individuals. Okay. Right now they're not independent entities. Many people are not independent entities. They live in fear of really dying tomorrow because they don't know what will happen tomorrow. Okay. So if and we their can hope fix is that, in the leaders that they have. Yes, their hope is in the leaders that they have. Now, if we can work on our country and develop it, to a point where people are able to make good decisions. And the Greek philosophers talked about this many years ago, 2,500 years ago. They talked about it. That democracy works where people are able to make independent, rational decisions. But when they are not able to, then they are manipulated. And that is what is happening in our country. So we don't have the leaders we deserve. We have the leaders that have been hoisted upon us because of the system that we have, which is unfortunate. Yeah. System. Narima. I think it's a, it's a very philosophical question. And um, I've actually been going back and forth with the answer. I want to be able to answer but I do believe in God that I do and I do know that the life that we have is intentional it is planned I believe that and so that goes back to the systems or the leaders that we have in some instances I want to say I'm Teresa where I feel that the individuals that we have it's because of the system that we have bad people then we have no choice but also in the same token I have seen the right people who've been pushed out, but fight to get back onto that ballot paper. So it goes back to, yes, the system has created this barrier, but the people, there are people who've pushed through that wall. So it's possible. It didn't have to take a lightning from heaven to be able to do that for us. It's people who decided to make that decision. So that's why, in a sense, I believe that in every day, we are taught lessons. And in every day, we are to learn from those lessons. Are we as people learning from those lessons? No. We have been independent for 50 plus years, but we're still going back to the same sort of leadership. We're still in the three same problems we started with in independence, which is ignorance and disease and poverty. And so we're still trying to form and still trying to come to solutions of that. But I do think that as the population grows, as we find more young people inside the population being the majority, things will get too difficult for us to sit here and to continue to complain about the rotten fruit in our basket. It will come to a point where we must come to a decision to do something about it. Okay. And I believe that again is God's plan. I would say yes to the two statements, but again, um, my people perish because uh, they lack enlightenment. Um, it's time that um, we get more enlightened about our rights, the values that we represent, so that we don't keep saying that leaders, the leaders we get are a reflection of who we are. Are we really <laughs> those kind of people who put the, some of the leaders we see in place? Um, is this that the best that we can offer to this country, or is, is that the best that we deserve? Let's give credit to some of the good leaders we have in this country. We need to acknowledge them and ask the question, how come some who are not as good do not seem to learn from these role models? Whom are they walking up behind? Whom are they looking up to? You know, So that even when uh, we hear a lot of uh, the benchmarking trips you know, by some of the, you know, um, people in this country, what are they benchmarking when there is a lot that can be learned just in this country? Because those systems exist. We have some good structures. We have good leadership in this country. Let's emulate that which is working. Let's also, as citizens of this country, raise our voices. Okay. Let's seek the best for us so that we don't just sit back and say, yeah, it's happening, this is our country, this is who we are, we can't sit pretty and accept the mediocre. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, 
gentlemen and ladies today it's difficult i almost say gentlemen and ladies <laughs> because that's what we are used to right. but I, I, again as we end um on the question of um, leadership comes from god you know whenever that is raised i ask myself so did god give ugandan samin or did uh germans hitler mm. and then the americans are now asking <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's, it's very interesting, but I want to thank you very much, uh, Pamela Mbure, for coming, uh, Nerima Wako, uh, Dr. Caesar, and of course, uh, Teresa, for coming to share your perspective on leadership. And let's hope that some of these things that are being said here, actually there are people who hear them, and as Nerima says, young people make 52% of the population, I think, right? More. More now. Over 70%. Over 70% of the population, <laughs> but the voting population, that's yes, what I mean. 50. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, listening and they can make the change and the change begins with them. I want to thank you very much for coming.